Hello, my little nightmares. The creepypasta I have for you today is the tale of a man's terrifying exploration into the forest behind his home. It was 1954 when Nancy and Bernard lived out on Green Hill Road. They lived alone on that long, well-traveled stretch of dirt, which mainly consisted of farmland and a rather large forest that loomed behind their home. He was an often belligerent drunk, and she stayed at home, although there was nothing for her to do there, as the two had never had children, and she had never taken up a job. The unfortunate truth was that the home had always been silent of the laughter and crying of offspring they could call their own, as Bernard was unable to provide such things for Nancy. Although she wouldn't say it, she regretted ever having married a man like Bernard, especially as of late, because he had been treating her with a foul disdain of which she was growing callous against. Their nights were now spent in horrid shouting matches, where both would say things they later wished to rescind, but the damage was always beyond repair. On the subject of repair, their home was in a truly sorry state. It was a three-floor house that was painted an off-yellow color that really didn't fit the aesthetic of the road of which it was carelessly built. The house was paid for by an inheritance Bernard had received from his father passing away, but he refused to use any more of it to fix the multitude of necessary issues within the home. Nancy would bring this fact up in their arguments daily, and Bernard would escape into the bottom of a bottle. One night, not so unlike every other night, Bernard returned home late as usual. He was wearing a dirty old trench coat that hardly resembled its original gray color due to the hardened mud covering it. He must have stumbled and fell into a puddle somewhere. At least, that's what Nancy thought upon seeing him. He sighed to himself because he knew it would just be another reason for them to argue. Like most nights, he was well on his way to being drunk, lost in a stupor of his own doing, and after having spent much of the afternoon in Jay's tavern. You could say Bernard sought as much time away from Nancy as he could get. But who is the real cause for their problems here? The answer is both. Neither one of them are willing or have been willing to fight the demons that claw at their backs. Their situation was a lose-lose, something truly devastating. Bernard hung his hat up slowly, hoping to do his best to appear sober, even though Nancy already knew he wasn't. His whiskey burnt cheeks told no lies, and the light staggering of his body was undeniable in her eyes. How could he have stooped so low? When they first met, Nancy was happy. Bernard was everything she could dream of, but that quickly changed when the war started. He was gone, and she was left all by her lonesome, with nothing but hope to keep her company. Every night she wished for a safe return, and when he finally did, she was delighted. But that only lasted until she realized he wasn't the same person. It wasn't as if he had been replaced, but war changes you, and when Bernard returned, the bottle was his only comfort. It only spiraled downward from there, and now their lives hang by a single thread, stretched so thin even a light breeze could snap it. Was tonight the night it would all come crumbling down? Perhaps. Nancy, as per usual, started questioning Bernard the moment his besotted eyes met hers. She shouted in a tirade of fed-up anger, Drunk again, I see. What's new, Bernard? When will you come home sober for once? Or better yet, when will you stop coming home at all? Her words were sharp, even for the intoxicated Bernard. Come on, Nancy, began Bernard, slurring his words and mumbling, in the hope that the argument could be bypassed. I'm sorry, okay? Can we please not fight tonight? My head is just killing me. Nancy grew angry, furious even, because how dare he complain about the state of his befuddled mind when each day her mental health is beaten down further and further. Your head is hurting, huh? You know what might fix that, Bernard? Drinking water for once. I didn't marry you to clean up your messes every abysmal night. She was right. Bernard had grown disorderly because of his drunken antics. Bernard sat down on the bench under the coat rack. He rubbed his head for a moment, trying to sift through the dizziness caused by his drinking, 
but only managed a crass and damaging response. Nancy, you don't understand. I'm not happy. I haven't been happy since before the war. Why do you always have to act so hateful? Get off my back. Tonight, Bernard had crossed the line, and rightfully so. Nancy approached him and reeled her hand back before letting loose an open-handed smack, then nearly knocked Bernard's head off his shoulders. Get out, she shouted with a malicious fury. This is my house, retorted Bernard as he rubbed his cheek. Not tonight, it isn't. I don't want to even sense an inkling of your presence in this house while I try to sleep. Go, I'm sure Chuck will let you stay with him. Bernard thought to himself for a time. Although he had consumed an above-average amount of alcohol, he still had enough sense to realize that Nancy was speaking from a place of great hatred. He could feel the seething aggression wafting off of her. Fine, uh, I'll go, said Bernard in a cowardly retreat. He was tired more mentally than physically, and he really just wanted Nancy to be happy again. Not like him. He didn't think life would ever allow happiness for him. Not after the things he did overseas. Nancy only watched and waited until he left the house, with his muddy trench coat and his tattered hat. What she didn't know was that Bernard had burned bridges between him and Chuck by borrowing money for him to buy more whiskey. This, unfortunately, prompted Chuck to cast Bernard to the proverbial curb. In other words, he would find no shelter there. So, he started to walk. He thought to himself, I wish I had a bottle right now. He even pretended he was holding one in an effort to keep his urges satiated. Where would he go? Maybe he would sleep under the stars in the cornfields again. Or perhaps he would stow away in a farmer's barn? He slept under the house before, but that wasn't ideal. But then it came to him. The woods. He thought, why not? As he began walking around the house, Plenty of protection with all those trees. Luckily for Bernard, it was the middle of summer, which meant that cold wasn't as much of a worry as the prospect of comfortability. But the drink had numbed his nerves. Needless to say, comfort wouldn't matter much. Bernard used the light of the moon and the blanket of stars to guide his blurry vision as he entered the tree line. In his mind, these were his woods, and he had traversed them many times. But tonight, they felt different. They felt like a mother's embrace, almost as if he was meant to be there. He began to wonder if he could just close his eyes and let the force carry him to sweet dreams ever after. However, his conscience reminded him that he wasn't someone who deserved such things, and that thought kept his addled mind fixated on each new step into the thick entanglement. As a man who had seen far too many atrocities during the war, you would think the sounds of nature would be welcoming but not for Bernard. Even the occasional hooting of an owl was enough to make bumps rise on his dry skin, and for some reason unknown to him, the chirping of crickets were scaring him as well. He asked himself aloud as he didn't care because who could hear him. Come on, Bernard. You're going to let some pesky insects shake your nerves? Of course he wouldn't. But the sounds coming from the dark of the woods around him did not remind him of insects. They were foreign sounds, things he was trained to detect during his stint in the army. His reflexes kicked in and he shot down to the ground. He instinctively laid on his stomach while he waited to potentially see the cause for his alarm. But the longer he waited, the more he realized it was probably a woodland animal, a raccoon perhaps. The fleeting fear left his body and he rose to his feet, although it was with a drunken stumble. Bernard leaned against a nearby tree for support. It was a strong tree, one that he felt he could talk to if he had the mind to do it. His mind was always elsewhere, though, and while he tried desperately to seek reprieve, something in the woods had different plans. A loud crack of a twig rang out through the mostly quiet forest, and it prompted Bernard to spin around in the sound's direction. Obviously, the darkness was not his friend, and even if he wanted to spot an approaching threat, he figured, Why do I bother? What did he have to live for anyway? His marriage and home were in ruins, so the idea of being erased from the earth out here in the woods didn't sound half bad. Nevertheless, something willed him to carry on. 
After all, he came out here looking for a place to sleep, and that was that. While Bernard continued to saunter his inebriated way through what he would dub as his forest, he wondered as to why he hadn't found a viable place to lay his weary mind. But then he saw something he would say was rather curious, while others would call it an absolute conundrum. Ahead, a short walk away, was a lit clearing. It didn't appear circular. The trees were just separated as if they had grown that way, solely for whatever was in this clearing. As Bernard inched closer, he saw a sight most peculiar. A bench and a light. It wasn't a strange fairy-built mushroom bench or something out of folklore. It actually appeared as if it had been lifted out of the big city and plopped right there in what he thought was the middle of the woods. Both the bench and the light were no different than what you might see walking down the sidewalk in New York. Stranger still, however, was that there was a man wearing an expensive suit sitting on the bench. He was reading a newspaper, but Bernard couldn't see any of the words from where he stood, cowering in the shadows cast by the anomalous sight. How was this man all the way out here, in his woods? Better yet, how had a bench and a light been moved here without his noticing? He concluded he would find no solace in these woods tonight, not with the sudden turn of events anyway. Then the man with the newspaper held high spoke to Bernard. He offered a friendly inclusion. Why don't you come have a seat? He asked calmly while adjusting the straightness of the paper. The man's voice sounded muffled, but Bernard chalked it up to the newspaper blocking the projection of his words. Who are you and why are you in my woods? Bernard asked aggressively, but with great curiosity. The man said again, very quietly. Please, sit down. Bernard was bewildered. Why don't you answer my question first? He demanded with a certain drunken demeanor. If you have a seat, I will explain everything, said the man with a foreboding tone. Against his better judgment, Bernard was somewhat compelled to do as the man said, and before he knew it, he was walking over to the bench. His knees creaked and cracked as he sat down next to the man on the hard wooden bench, but the man didn't seem to mind. Silence spread between them, and Bernard used it as an opportunity to study the mystery surrounding him. The light was actually a street lamp, the color of which was a dark green. Its orange glowing bulb pierced his eyes if he stared for too long. The bench under him was mostly wood, save for the legs and arm rails, and that was all there was. Strange, thought Bernard. It was beginning to feel comforting to sit here next to whoever this man was. Maybe this is all a dream, he thought again. He wondered if he had passed out somewhere near the start of the forest. But if he did, he didn't mind. You're not dreaming, said the man. His words startled Bernard, and they rattled his nerves. Had he somehow read his mind? The man was entirely unfamiliar to Bernard, and stranger still, what little he could see of his face seemed to be changing, almost as if he couldn't maintain its form or shape. It frightened Bernard deeply with a resoundingly fearful sensation, though he did not show it for the man to see. You may be wondering why you're here, began the man with a certain warmth to his voice. He was wearing a black business suit and a wide-brimmed hat, like one you might wear if you worked in the fields to protect your head from the sun. But his hat was elegant and unsullied. No, I'm wondering why you're here, croaked Bernard with the stench of alcohol wafting off his breath in the man's direction. The importance of that question is wasted on you said the man, with a touch of anger in his tone. Bernard clenched his clammy fists before lashing out at the man. Listen here, you. I came out here to find a place to sleep, and unless you aim to lay a bed out for me, then I suggest you get out of my woods. Suddenly, the man turned towards Bernard, and he was struck with fear instantaneously. He realized that the changing of his face wasn't because of his drunken eyes. It was because a deteriorating skull was concealed underneath. Bernard had never seen anything like this, and before he could react, the man grabbed both sides of his face and pierced his skin with sharp fingers. Your woods? shouted the man. These are my woods, 
And now you will be witness to the tremendous horror that I keep contained within this wooden prison. Blood began pouring out of the tiny puncture holes in Bernard's face, and he winced in pain. You foul little creature, how I loathe the presence of thee. Soon you will understand. The man stood up, releasing Bernard only to display his immense presence. He towered over him, and his suit slowly transformed into a blackened robe. Bernard recoiled in terror. He held his hands in front of his face as if that would somehow protect him from the menacing form before him. The man's visage became malignant and disturbing, and Bernard could only watch as this being changed into something unholy. While he sat there frozen in fear like a living statue, the man lowered his disheveled head all the way down to meet Bernard face to face. Now you see, I am a ravenous force, he mused violently. What do you want with me? Stammered Bernard as his jaw clenched from the unbearable fright he was experiencing. I want to play a game, said the man after rising back to his looming stature. A a game? Asked Bernard, confused and rightfully so. Yes, said the man with a tongue like a writhing snake. It was odd that the decomposing skull resting on his shoulders could show so much emotion. I'm afraid I I don't know what you mean, shouted Bernard with intense horror racking his brain. Silly creature, muttered the man. I will give you one chance to redeem yourself. Who are you? asked Bernard with a terrible stutter. Isn't it obvious? wondered the man as wings of black spread far from his spine, covering Bernard in an immense shadow. Then the man produced a wicked scythe, the shape of which was constructed with human limbs. He held it high above his head before sinking down low to once again look Bernard in the face. I am death. I'm dead? Questioned Bernard with wide bloodshot eyes. No, but if you do not succeed in my game, you will be. Spoke death with a hoarse, soulless voice. Bernard's heart felt like it could burst out of his chest at any moment. What could he do? He could just say no and be done with all of it. But something in him, perhaps his army training, forced him to fight. Fine. What is it I have to do? You see this bench? Asked Death with a strained whisper. His lanky, skeletal fingers were caressing the back of the bench's wooden upper rest. You must run in any direction for five minutes. If you can do that and make it back to this bench without succumbing to me, then your soul will be redeemed. My soul is damned? Bernard asked inquisitively. It will be if you do not succeed. His death from under his darkened hat. Bernard didn't know what to think. He didn't know if he should do what the man claiming to be death proposed, or if he should try to run out of the forest. The soldier in him prevented the notion of retreat and that forced him to accept the terms of death's game. You have a deal, he said sternly. What little skull Bernard could see grinned maniacally before saying, wonderful, and then nothing. Bernard looked around frantically. Have we started? He asked hysterically. You have already wasted more than 20 seconds, said death, prompting Bernard to begin sprinting deep into the woods. He ran and ran. He was lucky that the adrenaline had all but sobered him up because running while intoxicated is an intensely one-sided situation. One cannot hope to maintain their feet on the ground while prancing through a shadowy forest with their stomach full of the drink. Bernard had that going for him, but that was all he had. He knew he was out of shape. His breathing said that much. By the time he realized that, He also realized he hadn't been paying attention to how much time had already passed. He didn't even think his body would allow him to run for five whole minutes without collapsing. But then again, the circumstances were drastically different, and I might say, quite unique. Without any warning, Bernard heard an echoing whisper in the trees. It said, That is far enough, creature. Although it wasn't loud, he knew it was the voice of death or the man claiming to be the infamous reaper of humankind. Bernard spun around in every direction. 
He knew it would be difficult to traverse these woods without a light source, and he also surmised that death had tricks up his sleeve, things that would hinder his advance towards the bench. Time is ticking. The voice came again like a careless breeze. Shut your mouth, I'm thinking, shouted Bernard. He didn't like the vocal intrusion. It was an immense distraction for him. You do not command me, floated another set of words on the wind. Yeah, yeah, retorted Bernard. After spending far too much time trying to decide which way to go, he chose to backtrack. Well, actually, he chose to go back the way he thought he came, but he couldn't be sure. Regardless, he went and walked for several minutes, but there wasn't a sound nor a sign that showed he had gone the right way. Then he heard a raspy exhale from somewhere nearby. <sighs> huh? Who's there? Asked Bernard, peering between the trees surrounding him. A few quiet footsteps were approaching him, and he immediately put up his guard. There was more raspy breathing, like the sound one would make if they had the wind knocked out of them. Bernard did his best to focus his vision, but it was mostly useless because even if he was absolutely sober, the darkness reigned supreme out there. However, by some miracle, his eyes managed to adjust enough to make out basic shapes. That's when he noticed something standing between two large trees. It was a human-like figure standing shorter than him and keeping completely still. Who's there? He called out, but he wasn't given a response. The breathing continued, and because Bernard was staring at the figure, he could tell that the breathing was coming from its direction, if not from the figure itself. The figure began to approach Bernard. It was slow, deliberate, and cumbersome. As it got closer, its face became clear. It was Nancy. Honey, is, is that you? Asked Bernard, but Nancy had no words for him in response. What are you doing all the way out here? He asked further, but her form crept ever closer. Soon he realized this couldn't be Nancy unless she had died and been reanimated, because the being before him was a corpse. Bernard was well aware of what one looked like due to his time spent in the war, but he had never seen one walking. The shambling form coming his way mocked the likeness of his wife and made him feel sick. Stay away from me, trickster. I know you're not Nancy, shouted Bernard with his fists up in warning. The undead version of his wife moaned a breathy response while outstretching her arms towards him. <sighs> Despite the lack of light in the woods, Bernard was able to see the disturbingly grotesque entity approaching him. Maggots were feasting on a multitude of festering wounds donning her entire body, and Bernard gagged at the sight. She walked with an unstable footing. Her gait was in a limp, and her body was barely supported as if she was decomposing the closer she got to Bernard. He was fear-stricken and tempted to run, but a part of him deep down was fooled by the image slowly approaching him. He wondered if this could actually be his Nancy. And if it was, he wanted to help in any way possible. Bernard moved to meet her awkward form, and as he was about to speak, the creature he thought was Nancy bared a gaping maw of needlepoint fangs and sunk them deep into his exposed shoulder. He screamed in a way he didn't think his lungs could muster before, grabbing the disheveled head of the creature. The pressure of his hands gripping the sides of its head caused the skull to cave in and implode entirely, but it didn't stop its assault. The two spun around in a dance of death while Bernard tried desperately to free himself from this dreaded version of his wife. As they turned and turned, Bernard caught sight of a tall shadow standing amongst the trees, and he knew right away that it was the being claiming to be death. His lurking gaze pierced Bernard's soul, and it took all the strength in his body to force the gnawing creature from him so he could run away. Bernard ran in the direction he thought he had come from originally, all the while, he could hear staggeringly quick footsteps behind him. But he made a mistake. He couldn't keep the nagging thought of what was chasing him out of his mind, the result of which led him to glance over his shoulder while sprinting full bore and smack head on into a tree. The impact dazed him and caused his body to slump to the ground. Bernard opened his eyes to see stars swirling in his vision. A bump began to form on his forehead as well, and the point of contact was aching fiercely. 
freaking trees, he said aloud before realizing the reason why he was running in the first place. He stood up and nearly stumbled and lost his footing due to his dizziness as he scanned the forest for his assailant. Nothing appeared to be following him, and it made him sigh with relief. In his mind, he thought that this was all a hallucination, likely caused by drunken delusion, and colliding with the tree knocked his thoughts straight. That was before the tree wrapped itself around him. Bernard's lungs began to compress as his chest cavity grew closer to being caved in. The tree's wooden limbs squeezed tightly with the force of ten constrictors without any sign of letting up. This rooted evil was quickly snuffing out the flame of his soul and his eyes bulged and his skin turned purple. It looked like the end for poor old Bernard. But death had other plans. You see, death truly loved his games and to have his participant die off so early was just not what he wanted. Death enjoyed the chase. He enjoyed the struggles of watching the souls of the damned grasp for humanity, but failing miserably. To death, men like Bernard were a dime a dozen, which was why he commanded the tree to release the poor fool. His fate was sealed anyway, and furthering the game sounded much more fun. Bernard choked and reached for his throat upon being released. His windpipe felt like it had been throttled, and his chest felt as though a one-ton brick had fallen on it. To make matters worse, he began to hear that ominous sound of odd pattern footsteps approaching. His ears were ringing, but those steps were nigh unmistakable, and fear instantly retook its hold over his sorry soul. Sure enough, the ragged, needle-tooth-bearing mockery of his wife emerged from a nearby bramble and began to descend upon him. Bernard pulled himself together and found his feet carrying him through the forest once more. But now he was lost entirely and without an accurate direction, he began to feel hopeless. But nowhere was safe for Bernard. He began to hear quick footsteps followed by childlike laughter. They passed behind him, in front of him, all around him. Are there children playing in the forest? He thought as the laughter continued and grew closer. However, Bernard didn't realize that something hellish was currently standing directly over his shoulder. He felt a warm breath against his neck, <sighs> and his body instantly became rigid. The fright he was experiencing was enough to give him a heart attack if he were further down in his luck. After he hadn't reacted to the initial breath, he felt another, <sighs> but this time a hand caressed his shoulder. Bernard subtly glanced to his right only to be beholden to an unsightly set of fingers belonging to who knows what. His immediate impulse was to sprint away, but where would he go? Surely any direction would simply lead to more terror, and Bernard was on the verge of giving up. No, he couldn't do that. I'm a soldier, he thought. I've handled pressure far greater than this. But as he turned around to face the bearer of that wretched hand, he realized that nothing could have prepared him for the malignant being now standing before him. It had two wide and black eyes and a snub nose. Even the faint moonlight shimmering through the trees cast enough glow for Bernard to see this creature's wretched body and intensely terrifying face. It seemed not to have a mouth, but it had tight, pale, and cracked skin lining every bone like it hadn't eaten for several weeks. Bernard felt relief over the fact that it appeared mouthless, but his relief was quickly relinquished to fear when a vertical row of sharp and bloody teeth were revealed. They were brown, like a deep rot had set in, and the smell was enough to cause him to retch. This being seemed to be studying Bernard. It would tilt his head and blink those black holes it had for eyes. But then, it opened its mouth wide before trying to engulf his head in its entirety. Bernard was prepared, though. He shoved the creature away and it wailed like a broken siren as it flopped around on its back. He wasn't going to make the mistake of waiting and took off once again into the forest with no clear direction in mind. By this time, it didn't matter to Bernard, he just wanted it to end in whatever way possible. However, he would not go down without a fight. But his woes were diminished when he spotted an inkling of faint light in the distance. He couldn't determine if it was coming from the street lamp but he knew it was better than nothing. 
Bernard continued running, but stopped when he heard the sound of a child crying. Not your typical cry you might hear. Not one of pain, but one of sadness. Loneliness. Something within Bernard compelled him to seek the child out. Perhaps it was the soldier in him that gave a certain sense of protective duty. Or it was the sole fact that he wasn't able to have children, but had always desperately wanted them. Regardless, he called out to the child. Hello? Are you lost? You shouldn't be out here. The child cried further. Please, help me. She sounded deeply frightened. Bernard was as well, but he could put aside his fear to comfort a lost little girl. Where are you? How did you get out here, sweetheart? He called out as gently and friendly as he could. I... I got lost. She said through a flood of tears. I can surely see that, darling. If you tell me where you are, I might be able to help you find your way back home. I... I don't know where home is. Her voice seemed to be getting farther away the closer Bernard got. Are you walking? If you are, stop and come the other way. I think you're going away from me. Please help. The young and terrified voice came once more, but now it sounded so far away it might as well have been the wind. Bernard then realized that he had walked a considerable distance away from the once visible light, and he spun around. There was nothing but darkness once again. He felt his heart being pulled to the damp ground. It was another moment of defeat, and he was washed over with a feeling of idiocy. He looked down and wondered how he would ever hope to reach the bench when he continued to fall for every trick death conceives. Amidst this idle thought, Bernard failed to notice the pair of eyes glaring at him from the shadow of the wood. But his sulking wouldn't prevent him from realizing he was being watched for long, especially when a second pair of eyes appeared, and then a third, then a fourth. Bernard looked up when he sensed the presence of several beings surrounding him. He wasn't going to fall for it this time. Immediately, he said, I'll have nothing to do with whatever you have planned for me. I'm going to that bench and I'm doing it right now. He then turned around and tried to march in the opposite direction, but he bumped into something unseen. It was waist high and whatever it was wavered upon contact. That's when he heard the giggling, childlike giggling that came from all around him. <laughs> the synapses in his brain began to fire on every cylinder and his impulses urged him to flee right away. He turned away from the obstacle in front of him and tried to run a different way. Once again, he bumped into another waist-high entity that giggled as he did. He turned around and quickly realized that he was being encroached on. The beings had created a circle that was closing in on him, and he wasn't able to actually see what he was up against. Bernard reached his hand out and instantly felt pain on his fingers. Something had bit him. Hard, too and he recoiled from the sensation. Then, he felt pressure near his left ankle, before suffering another bite on the tender skin of his calf. He tried to kick the air, but felt no resistance. However, when he didn't fight, the pain was immense and mounting. His arms, hands, legs, back, and even his face were being gnawed on by short creatures that moved so quickly that he had no chance of reacting. If you could imagine more than 50 pinpricks over the entirety of your body, but then size them up to the serrated teeth of a being the height of a child. Only then could you know the pain poor Bernard was enduring. Even when he thought he may have injured one, another would take its place. It seemed like a never-ending private hell, and this idea that he'd be free upon reaching the bench was a far-fleeting reality. But Bernard was in luck, because during his attempts at fighting off his adversaries, he felt his knuckles graze a branch above his head, at first, he thought it couldn't possibly support his weight, but after curling his fingers around the wood, he thought, what have I got to lose? He couldn't take the pain any longer, and he utilized his military training to pull himself by the strength of the branch. It had held, and not a moment too soon, because a single beam of moonlight shined through the trees onto the ground below and showed just what Bernard had been up against. They were children. Not normal children, though, these children had no eyes. They had four thin and long fangs protruding from their horrid mouths and no other discernible features. The worst part was that there was far too many of them to count, 
which meant that Bernard was mere moments away from likely being devoured by a plethora of tiny, fiendish teeth that would thrust his soul into an infernal hellfire, an eternal damnation of which he'd never return. Bernard clung to that branch for dear life, but he appeared out of options, despair for a man who had already had no hope left. But light is salvation, and the subtle glow from the street lamp came faintly into his view. It wasn't that far away after all, and a small bit of hope rekindled inside of Bernard's diminished and dwindling soul. Although a gruesome fate awaited him only a few feet below, he had a chance, and that was enough to push him forward. With seemingly nothing left to lose, aside from his life, Bernard hoisted himself onto the branch and took a leap of faith towards the ground and hopefully away from the fiendish vermin-like beings. As soon as his feet touched the forest floor, he began to sprint with adrenal intensity. He ran and ran and ran some more, but the light seemed further away. However, Bernard persevered and continued to run regardless of the potential outcome. After going through what he had, his only wish was to return to a normal life. A life with Nancy where he's realized the error of his ways and all becomes well. He kept those thoughts and hopes and dreams at the forefront of his mind and he ignored the hands of famine attempting to grasp at his feet. The starving servants of death were chasing him with nothing but malignant intentions, but he did not waver. Then he saw it, the bench. It might as well have been a sparkling jewel amidst a sea of sand with how shining the light appeared to a hopeful Bernard. But death was not pleased. He swooped his long body down, from an unknown perch and slunk his dubious way through the trees to try and intercept Bernard's path. However, something else must have been on his side this night, because before death was able to halt him, Bernard's fingers grazed the edge of the bench, ending the game. Death roared furiously and the streetlight flickered from the intense energy he gave off. Bernard pointed a shaky finger at death and said, Yes, I've beaten you. I've beaten your game. Death huffed, slunk his way around Bernard's shoulders. So you did, filthy sinner. Now you have to let me go. Let me go, demanded Bernard. Let you go? Why would I do that? Why would I let go what will only return to me and nothing short of soon? No riddles. You honor your end of this game and be gone. You dare to command me? Death stretched high above Bernard and covered him in a dubious shadow. I will let you go, filth. But know this. The soul that escapes me once will forever bear me over their shoulder. I will always be with you. I will always be ready to snatch your tarnished and tainted soul from that wretched prison you call a body. Continue traveling the way you are, Bernard and you will find yourself in my neck of the woods once again. And next time, there will be no game. Suddenly, Bernard awoke on the edge of the forest behind his house. He was sobered, clean, and his clothes were unsullied. It seemed death had set him on the right path, despite his desire for Bernard's soul. Bernard stood up in the ill moonlight and felt a courage the likes of which he hadn't felt for many years. The courage to apologize to Nancy and to make things right, once and for all. Even though it was awfully late, the moment Bernard knocked on the front door, Nancy answered. She looked like she had been crying and by the subtle elation on her face, it was clear she was happy to see him. Bernard took off his hat and held it against his chest. Hello, dear, he said softly. Back already? She asked quietly. Yes, listen, I know I've really muddied things up between us, but if you can find it in your heart to forgive me, I promise I'll be the man you want, no, need me to be. I've had a rather strange night, and needless to say, I want nothing more than to crawl into bed with you and share our warmth. If you'd have me, that is. Nancy studied Bernard and felt something she hadn't felt in a long time. Love. She smiled and placed her hand on his shoulder, Oh, honey, of course I forgive you. Come inside away from those mosquitoes. Thank you, Nancy. 
said Bernard as he too began to feel a swelling love deep within his being. Although this story ends in happiness, the true reality is that many people never get the same chance Bernard did. And if they were given that same chance, many would not succeed. Bernard and Nancy remained married for the rest of their lives and Bernard never found his hand gripping the tantalizing glass of a bottle forevermore. Oh, and he never did set foot in that forest ever again, even during the day. Death kept it, and Bernard stayed away, ever mindful of the horrifying experience the Grim Reaper of yore conceived. One thing is certain, though. While Bernard lived a relatively peaceful life from that point on, he couldn't help but notice every time the sick and twisted version of Nancy was staring at him through the window, tapping on the glass and weeping for him to let her inside. Perhaps Bernard lost more than he gained from his encounter with death. Who's to say? Who's to say?